slender and boyish. I mean, he didn't have the confidence of a man. I saw him grow in his competitiveness amongst people like Steve Gould and uh, all those other guys that were in that graduate program when Niles was still an undergraduate. We got engaged to get married on New Year's Day of 1964. And uh, at the end of my junior year in Niles, as we got married. Rocky pods are not, a, they're not symmetrical. I understand that. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm aware of that. And that's where I find a lot of them. And I'm surprised at how well delineated, especially the eyes are. That always just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you, can you see the lenses on the eyes? The head t tends to come off the rest of the body and go this way, hmm. upside down. In most of the stuff in the Sandy Faces in Central and Eastern New York, uh, that's all gone. And what you have is the mud impression in the interior, mm -hmm. sometimes beautiful. That's what you had in what you just showed me. Interior I collected all over the United States, but starting here, this was the core central area. It's the Hamilton Group near Hamilton, New York. It's named for that. It's it's called the type section of the Middle Devonian of North America because uh, all the rocks are correlated to this. So this becomes a very important place. A couple of trial bike sounds. Oh my god, great. That's really cute. I'm gonna keep this one. This is good. The Hamilton group is mostly these kinds of uh, uh, fine grained uh, sandstones or mudstones, uh, whatever they might be, usually fo highly fossiliferous. There's, I think, five or six hundred feet of rock all stacked up and um, go through time, maybe five million years, maybe six million years. It's hard to be e exact. But the fossils are fundamentally similar all the way out throughout the section. It's a marine vertebrate fauna. It's called the Tropodileptus fauna. And it's got uh, lots of brachiopods, lots of clams, lots of snails, and three or four species of trilobites if you get lucky. Wow, look at this one. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> More or less the same species are found throughout. There are some exceptions. And, uh, uh, but the interesting thing is none of these uh, fossils seem to change through, through millions of years of time. None of them do. And we always assume that if you had that much time and the good collecting, which is what we have here, you would inevitably find gradual change in your fossils. And so I was here. I was looking for, for that kind of change and it scared me that I couldn't find it. I was doing my PhD, and you need positive results. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Since the 30s, uh, people like Ernst Meyer and, uh, I would, and Theodosius Dobzhansky particularly started to once again stress the importance of geography and, and geographic variation and isolation in the formation of new species. <laughs> After Darwin finally stopped, was, got off the stage, but his books were out, he was being discussed, a hiatus of about 75 years where isolation was barely addressed by people talking about uh, evolution. But by and large, that whole theme disappeared from the scene. Uh, so it was like a long period of dark ages. So the hiatus was abruptly broken because of the genetics laboratory at Columbia University, Thomas Hunt Morgan's famous fly room, uh, where they discovered uh, genes on the salivary glands of, of fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, and the fact that genes are on chromosomes. That was a very important discovery. 
So here's a guy who's a systematist. He worked on ladybird beetles, but he had a hankering, a desire to learn uh, about the genetics, and he had a background with a teacher who was interested in evolution. He was a naturalist. In fact, he was a taxonomist of beetles, of ladybird beetles. He was invited to come to the United States with the help of a, a Rockefeller grant. And he went to Morgan's lab in Pasadena. And he now became acquainted with the thinking and the methods of the geneticists. He suddenly saw how he could put the two things together. In uh, 1935, he published a very short paper, and he says basically nobody's been looking at the most important f evolutionary phenomenon, which is that there are gaps between species. Dobzhansky said, well, there are uh, what he called isolating mechanisms, but it must start with physical geographic isolation, or at least that would be the easiest way to imagine the beginnings of, of that kind of isolation. He provided the basis that published in 19. 37 and a book called Genetics and the Origin of Species. He provided the uh, necessary basis. Very important book with all of this material in it and a lot more data, but that was the gist of his ideas and that species are discrete and they, and they become discrete through a natural process. I was born in a little town in southern Bavaria, the town of Kempton, on the 5th of July 1904. This means that I'm now more than 93 years old. While I was at the American Museum, I was interested not only in bird taxonomy, but also in other aspects of birds. For instance, I discovered that there was a geographic variation of degree of sexual dimorphism, and Don invited me to come to seminars to Columbia University, which I did as I was going and I became more and more friendly with the department there. And then Professor Dobzhansky arrived from California, from uh, Pasadena, and I invited him to come to the museum and study my wonderful cases of geographic speciation in birds, and he was quite excited about this, and I was excited about his lectures. And it was actually Meyer who gets the credit for uh, coming up with the definition of species as reproductive communities. But as, as I say, um, that was really Dobzhansky, and for that matter, it was already there uh, in Darwin, in the old Darwin, but they didn't know what the old Darwin said in his, uh, in his notebooks. There was one other uh, sort of event, one person that should be mentioned before uh, we start talking about the punctuated equilibria, and that would be George Gaylord Simpson, also at the American Museum of Natural History. Simpson always remained a gradualist. He said, well, while the importance of isolation is, is uh, been well established, basically he didn't care about it at all. So why am I talking about him now? Simpson wrote Tempo and Mode in Evolution, and it's about the paleontological uh, perspective on evolutionary matters. But he had this attitude that what happens to a hundred rats in the course of 10 years under laboratory conditions is likely to be rather different to what happens to millions of rats over millions of years uh, as you go through geological time. And what he had in mind was the relatively abrupt appearance of large-scale groups of organisms like mammals or like whales and bats are famous examples inside the mammals. Because once you get a bat in the fossil record, it's a bat and it has that complex uh, anatomy. They're primitive in many respects, but the basic adaptations, the thing that makes them bats is already there. You can't just extrapolate a gradual thing because these orders of mammals would have had to, if they all evolved just slowly and gradually, way back in the Mesozoic, and there's no fossil evidence to support that. So it indicates that there were rapid bursts of evolutionary change. He said it even applies to species, but he never really talked about that. It was just these large-scale groups that he felt uh, needed some special explanation. Macroevolution, that means the evolution of higher 
categories of higher types, of evolutionary novelties, of all the things that go over long periods of time, and that, for instance, also interests the paleontologist. The bottom line for us kids was that uh, the fossil record can be trusted and has a real signal in there, and we should go ahead and, uh, and see what we can see about evolution in the fossil record. I got to know these rocks and fossils through Bud Rollins, who was a, uh, he was two years ahead of me in graduate school. He's a paleontologist, he's from up here, and suggested I work on this trilobite fake hops instead of the snails I was working on, which are more simple. I, we thought maybe with a more complicated anatomy that trilobites have, that it would be uh, perhaps easier to find some ev evidence of, of evolutionary change. Look at all the look at all the breaks and Lugos uh, right. interruption. Had a rough life. Rough life. Things were tough in the Devonian. When I was at Colgate as an undergraduate, oh. Bob Lindsley, who was a remarkable teacher, was interested in the Anderdon limestone in Michigan, and right. he came to join Colgate. And I tried to convince him that there's a wealth of stuff around here. Right. And I took him out. Pretty soon, he slowly. Never gave up the uh, Anderdon, but he collected with me all over right. central and western New York. Bob was remarkable. He, he'd find a trilobite, and all of a sudden it would disappear, and he'd have it in his cheek pouch, and he'd dig it out later. Oh, look at that. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Very inspirational teacher. The trilobites have heads. They have middle bodies that are flexible segmented, and then they have a tail at the end. And the great thing about fake hops is that it has eyes that preserve beautifully. And big lenses so you can count the lenses and so forth and that turned out to be the whole trick to understanding the evolutionary history basically of this particular group of species. Boy was he serious then and determined and uh, focused and he studied like crazy and worked very hard giving himself eye strain, do, measuring all these columns of eyes on the trilobites on the fake opsorana. My big eureka moment came when I realized that with the kinds of uh, data on the eyes that I uh, was copying the format from uh, uh, Ewan Clarkson, I had different populations. We had 17 columns of lenses in the eyes. You, I defy anybody to show me a trilobite from from here with well-preserved eyes that does not have 17 columns of lenses. Going into Ontario, southern Ontario, and also uh, Michigan and uh, northwestern Ohio, we found specimens with 18 columns of lenses. Not only were, were, was this uh, trilobite stock, the species, derived from, from the Old World province, but there was some evolution going on once they got here. So the ancestral form, I, I concluded, lived on in the clearer waters of the, of the Midwest. It was all flooded by ancient seas. People don't know that, but the sea was covering much, much of North America then. And it was here, closer to shore, with these muddy conditions, that we, we see a chain. The older Hamilton rocks all have 18 columns of lenses in, in these particular trilobites. Then the sea withdrew from the uh, continent. So everything in the Midwest became extinct. Everything lived here in this, uh, this basin, this, it's the Appalachian Basin. When the seas were flooded back again into the continental interior, these were the ones that came out because the other ones had been driven extinct. So in the Midwest, you get a pattern of 18 and then 17, and then finally, at the very top, 15. In the late 60s, I, when I finally figured out what I, my story about what happened to these trilobites and how they evolved in sort of basically jumps, and they would be stable, but then they would then have a, a little event, speciation event, not a huge amount of anatomical change, but from one state into another state, and the recognizable, they persisted that way for a long period of time, and also geographically for a long period of time. I wrote a, uh, a paper up the first draft of which I sent to some of my friends. I gave it one to uh, Bud Rollins, but also 
Steve Gould had already gone up to Harvard um, in 1969, I guess. Well, the first thing that he wrote, which really he laid out everything before he collaborated with the great uh, Barnum and Bailey promoter, Steve, he wrote the same paper essentially, and he launched it on the world and it sank without a trace. Steve Gould had already gone up to Harvard. Um, and Steve was a dynamo. He was, uh, he was very interested in evolution, but he was also very interested in getting going on, on publishing. And why wait till you're 60 and, and, you know, before you start thinking about these things and publishing? I used him as a role model, just as I used Bud for the rocks and the fossils. And he was, he was an inspiration to get out there and believe in yourself <laughs> and think about these things. On the land, our souls are resting. The paper was published in Evolution, which is a strange place for paleontologists to publish, but I, I thought it was of, of greater evolutionary significance. So before it, was, it came out, I got a phone call from Steve saying this is this book that's being organized by Tom Schaff. Uh, Tom's idea, and I think it was a good one, was to try to get more con conceptual thinking, theoretical thinking injected into paleontology. Steve was very interested in uh, morphology and also patterns of development. And that was his first choice. He wanted to do growth, and form, and maybe even systematics. But those titles had already been given. The closest thing to what he wanted to do was on speciation. And he called me up and he said, I really want to be part of this, but I don't know what to say that's not already in your paper that you sent me. He said, would you like to join? And I said, sure, that would be, that would be an honor for me and a, and, a, and a wonderful opportunity. So he said, all right, fine. And he said to me, um, I'll give the paper in uh, Washington and write, and, and write the, uh, be senior author of the abstract. Uh, because I know that you're nervous giving papers, which is off and on true, and uh, that's true enough, and you can be the senior author on the paper, which is really one of the dumbest things he ever did. I said, deal, it's a deal, you know? So I wrote the first, I wrote a new manuscript, and he took that, and it's pretty much intact with a little bit of improvement in the writing in the middle section of the punctuated equilibria paper that we published in 1972 in Tom Shop's book, Models of Paleobiology. So Niles retired in 2010 and uh, he was able to retain his office for some years after then. So only in 2014 did the bulk of his papers come to the library. I think he might have been saving some of his more critical materials um, in his home library, but then wanted to have everything in one place. So he passed them over to us. Now, Niles gave me the very first draft of the paper, which he had written. Um, and then I was able to compare that to the subsequent drafts and then the final product, and actually to go through and identify um, precisely who contributed what. I, I sort of block out um, with different colors which author contributed what. And the way they collaborated was to send the drafts back and forth to each other. But, you know, Niles wrote his portion and then Steve wrote his portion. But what Steve added later is Steve. And, and you can still see, though, entire paragraphs, even pages, that are from the, basically verbatim from the original draft that, that Niles wrote, that are then surrounded by this additional prose and argumentation that, that, that Steve contributed. Especially in those days, people, people wrote for the field, they didn't write for, the, for a popular audience, and uh, the more abstruse and recondite your vocabulary, the better. But then, of course, it became impossible, practically. To, to dig out what the significance of something was. If he didn't have a talent for self-promotion, well, uh, Steve came into his life to take care of that. We had had dinner with Steve and his then wife, Debbie, and um, we were parting ways because wherever we had rendezvous, it was probably some restaurant in Broadway, we were going north, they were going south. They lived a one stop south of us. That was when 
Steve had tried to assert some greater uh, dominance in the presence uh, in his in his amount of input uh, to uh, what Niles always refers to as punk geek. We're on the uptown side of the IRT subway platform and Steve and Debbie are on the downside. And if looks could have turned into darts, Steve would have dropped down dead at that moment because Niles, whether this was the moment that Steve really tried to gain proprietorship or whether it was just looming, I do remember Niles was really bent out of shape. The picture that emerged to me was that quite clearly the theory was Niles. Um, uh, that, um, and, and I don't think that Steve, at least at that time, would have argued with that. But other than that, he and Steve were always really tight really tight and they got along they understood and I think they really helped each other you know and of course what they say about academia is it's all about the reputation because there's no money involved so everybody fights even harder over the reputation we saw Steve saw as well as I did that uh, there were some implications for uh, punctuated equilibria we essentially reinvented the geometry the geometric depiction of the history of life. Instead of gradual change and everything, species with these dark black lines stay more or less the same as they go through time. There can even be relative um, survival of species, so you can get directional change through time, sort of like a species level selection effect, or there can be no real accumulation of change. This, these are axes of measuring uh, anatomical differences between species. But we're talking some of these maybe only lasted a million years or hundreds of thousands of years, but some of them lasted for millions of years. Selection of species, differential survival and or production of species, so that would be like a species selection. Steve Stanley actually gave that name. There was a whole discourse on species as individuals by Michael Giesler. It had nothing to do with our paper, but he was saying species are individuals. They have, you know, births, histories, and deaths, just like individuals do. That's that's the reinvention of Brocky. I think it's only in recent years that Niles is willing to let the the information uh, exist separate from the man. So everything has shaken down into place. But it's been. I think it's been a lifelong effort for Niles to um, feel comfortable with both his acceptance and with his non-acceptance. So I think we've come to a stable platform at this point. But was it troubling? Yes. Was it exciting? Absolutely.